Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger. It is a great day to be alive, and I am happy that you're here. My guest this week is Andrew Yang. He is, as you know, a former presidential candidate and the founder of Venture for America. He's also the founder of the Forward Party, where he advocates for structural reform to safeguard our democracy. And he lays all that out in his new book, Forward, which we discussed today. We also discuss very interesting things like Andrew's life as a teenager and his obsession with post-punk bands like The Smiths, Depeche Mode, and Nine Inch Nails, uh, an obsession I share, by the way. We talk about why he doesn't do drugs and how his parents felt when he got his ear pierced. But more to the point of his political career, we talk about money and politics and how money is the tail that wags the dog in both the GOP and the Democratic Party. He mentions why we should pay our politicians more, and we discuss entitlement reform and universal basic income, which, by the way, even if you don't agree with it, and I, for the record, don't, I think you'll agree that Andrew's efforts to fix the machine of politics are worthwhile and something we should all think about supporting uh, in whatever ways we can, because the current polarized political system is making everybody freaking miserable. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my conversation with Andrew Yang. Andrew Yang, welcome to Crazy Money. Well, thanks for having me, Paul. It's great to be here. I appreciate you taking time out of your personal life to talk to me. It's an honor to uh, get to know you a little bit, which I have done by watching lots of old interviews with you and also reading your new book, Forward. And one of the most interesting things I learned in this was as a teenager, you were into The Cure, Nine Inch Nails, and The Smiths. What about that music resonated with you? How old are you, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> I am 53 years old. That's why, that's why I start with this line of questioning. All right. So if you're 53, then you remember the 80s. Uh, and you remember there was something of uh, monoculture. There were three TV networks. Uh, and some of the only expression of any kind of uh, alternative um, angsty perspective to, to me came in the form of music. Uh, and there was a goth kid named Dan Miller in my my town who one summer just came back and had been listening to all these bands. And, and he was like the cool kid that we all turned to for uh, musical inspiration. So after hearing Depeche Mode and, and all these groups, I was like, oh my gosh, like, they don't play this on Casey Kasem Top 40. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. K K Casey didn't get it. No. That wasn't Casey's fault. But uh, but yeah, the, you know, it, it's funny because I think about music then and I, I feel like a fuddy-duddy, but um, those bands felt so important. And I look at kids today and I'm like, do they have bands that are similarly important? And I feel like music has kind of gotten sanded down like a lot of our culture. But then I... I think maybe that's just because I'm in my late 40s and, and that's what all middle-aged dudes think. Did you think that those bands were saying things that resonated with how you saw the world or or you just were exploring new and different things and that was something that was just outside of the cultural norm and it and it sort of resonated with your exploration for something a little bit better than what was readily available? Well, I think about Nine Inch Nails and when uh, Head Like a Hole and all that stuff came out, it felt so visceral and angry uh, and, um, kind of taboo, uh, you know, like I, I want to you like an animal, like stuff like that, <laughs> where you're like, no. feel you from the inside. That was taboo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all that stuff. So you're like, Whoa, you could say and do that. Uh, I went to the first three Lollapaloozas, Lollapalooza. Uh, and I remember being in the mosh pit with a bunch of other kind of mud covered teens. Uh, so that there was like a, a lot of the, the sense that um, it was how you participated in a youthful rebellion, though I was a relatively clean cut kid. Like I was around people who did drugs and the rest of it. And I always forewent that stuff because I was really concerned about my brain. <laughs> so I was just like, like must preserve brain chemistry. Um, so like, I, I felt like I got to participate in like a countercultural, um, community hanging out in, at those concerts and whatnot. Um, and, uh, I was really pissed off at that time too. I was really angry because I was one of the only Asian kids in my grade. Um, and so you feel sort of marginalized and you express that in different ways. What did your parents make of your fascination with new wave and that kind of music? 
They did not like it, particularly when I came home with an earring when I was 15. <laughs> they hated that thing. I, I had that. So I, and in my, you know, it's like my defense, sort of, I was cast in a high school play and they said, hey, we think your character should have an earring. And I was like, all right. And they were like, um, we prefer to have it actually be a real earring. And, and I was like, sure. <laughs> they said, so can we pierce your ear for this? And I said, fine. And then they pierced my ear with a gold hoop. And then I wore a gold hoop and like had it in when I went back home for the holidays. And then my parents were like, oh, no. Uh, and and my, my mom um, didn't say anything to me about it um, for the four years I had the earring in and then when i took it out she was like i hated that so much and and uh and i <laughs> said why did, you ever, why did you ever say anything and she said well i thought if i said anything you'd keep it in for an extra year <laughs> what a great mom that is a that is a wonderful thing that she gave you that latitude to to do it yeah it was, those are good times um but yeah my, my 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 parents are awesome um you know it's like i always make uh, asian parent jokes which have some uh truth to them but i think in the scheme of parents uh, i was very very lucky and my wife agrees because my wife gets along with my mom famously and and she always says like one reason i'm I'm, she's lucky is that uh, my mom is so awesome you did write that as a child of immigrants you were taught that nothing would come easily what what did your parents expect of you as a teenager and as a student well they they just said hey get good grades Uh, uh one thing they hammered into me and it's one reason why i ended up running for president and doing all these other things was they said if someone else can do something you can do it too because your ability level is so high that if you don't succeed, it's because you weren't trying. I think that they meant academically, um, mm. but I'd tested freakishly well when I was 12 years old and 13 years old. I was part of a Johns Hopkins national talent search. I think I got the highest SAT score in my school district when I was 13 or 14 or something like that. So my parents were always like, look, if you fail, it's because you're not trying hard enough. Um, and my, my father once said to me, he said, um, uh, you're going to have to work twice as hard as everyone else because you have an unhappy face. Uh, you, you look like you're <laughs> smiling because other people are in pain around you. And I was like, okay, dad. Um, so he, <laughs> so th- these are the kinds of messages I got from my parents. It was, uh, yeah. you know, I, I suppose in a way they were kind of, um, uh, dichotomous or self-contradictory because on one hand, it's like, you can do anything. And on the other hand, it's like, oh, you know, everyone's going to hate you. <laughs> did, did you study hard because you felt like you had to please your parents or did you feel like you had an opportunity to go accomplish something? Well, th- this is the the thing that I don't, I mean, this might sound obnoxious, whatever, but um, I was so determined not to be the Asian nerd in my school that mm. I did not study very hard throughout my um, early high school years. So I, in eighth grade, I was the number one student in the class. I got every award, um, which made, made the one uh, Asian girl who was trying to be valedictorian or whatever hate me. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> Um, but then ninth and tenth grade, I was rebelling in various ways. My grades were still good, um, but I, I certainly wasn't top of the class um, because I was too busy trying to be cool and listening to bands and trying to prove to people that I wasn't an Asian nerd and that I was tough or edgy um, or willing to get in a fight. Uh, and so grinding for grades didn't seem to line up with that very well, though it was so so much a part of my identity that I probably would have been shook if I genuinely like, you know, done poorly. Um, but I, I decided to go away to uh, prep school in New Hampshire. And it was my decision, uh, which is a weird thing in your teens. But uh, I went to Phillips Exeter Academy and there the academic rigor was much harder. And, and there I started studying hard. So uh, it, you know, it was a mixed bag in terms of, um, feeling like I, I needed to, I, I, I guess I was an unusual Asian kid in that my parents were like, Hey, get good grades, study hard. And I only took half of that seriously. I was like, get good grades, but then don't study hard. <laughs> well, Hey, if you can get good grades without studying hard, I mean, that's best of both worlds, right? 
Well, I mean, that, that's what happens in, it hadn't been in my public school, frankly, but it's one reason why I wanted to go away to a, a tougher environment. And Exeter was a very tough environment, so it whipped me into shape, though it, it kind of burnt me out such that when I showed up my freshman year, I kind of phoned in my first semester and ran into problems again. Um, the, the prep school I went to was so intense that uh, some kids burnt out in various ways. Uh, we had classes on Saturdays. You were supposed to wear a jacket um, to, to, to school every day. Uh, and, uh, it, it was an environment where you felt like where you got into college kind of determined your worth as a human being. It was that, that sort of culture. And, and, uh, I went back there and spoke when I was running for president and they, they're trying to be kinder and gentler now. I think they got rid of Saturday classes. I think their culture has shifted somewhat, but when I went, it was very intense. What was it like to be an Asian kid amidst a bunch of uh, middle class Asian kid amidst a bunch of entitled uh, rich white kids? Uh, well, Exeter numerically uh, was pretty diverse, but culturally it is to your point. Um, you know, I, I met kids who were uh, like had had like the Roman numeral four after their name. Uh, you know, I, I know a I, few of those kids. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, one, one friend of mine actually is uh Teddy Roosevelt's great, great grandson, uh, oh, wow. other people with major businesses named after them. Um, one guy, uh, his family literally built uh, Brown University where I went to college. And so um, everyone was like, oh, yeah, he's going to go there. Um, and it wasn't just that he went there. I think like his um, girlfriend went there, too. And everyone was like, oh, huh. <laughs> Like there, there, there was something, I mean, it, like who the heck knows whether that, you know, there was a relationship there. I mean, she might've just right. like, gotten in. The Browns of the Providence Browns. Uh, their, their, their name, their last name is not Brown, but it, it's, no, but, their, know, but, their, but their name literally is on the, like the, you know, foundational cornerstone of like half the buildings uh, on, on campus, which I found out when I got there. Yeah. So going to school with those kids. Uh, it, it was a mixed bag, but I tell people all the time that I never would have run for president had I not gone to that school because when you're around these kids, one of the things you realize is that they're not smarter than you. They're not better than you. Uh, you know, you can do whatever they can do. So it, in, in a way, it was like my um, parental, um, you know, messaging uh, coming to fruition where it was like, oh, these are the kids who are supposed to be running shit. Like, you know, then they're like, I'm smarter than them. <laughs> right, right. This is this is the elite. Come on, give me a break. That 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 was sort of the vibe I, I had. Um, you know, and I did well at Exeter. I finished in the top whatever, like uh, you know, like eight percent of the class, ten percent of the class, whatever it was. Um so I definitely did not feel like these kids were any better than me, that's for damn sure. You know, so I had a great career in technology. I worked at Yahoo and Facebook and some other startups and um you're just like one of the dozens and hundreds of people that I worked with that had come from middle class or the upper class and went to great schools and were interested in technology. And so as I sort of alluded to up top, as I'm reading your book and getting to know you through these interviews, I'm like, this is a regular guy. This is a, this is a guy that I'd love to have as a next door neighbor, drink a beer with, you know, have as a colleague. Um, and as I'm reading the book, I'm, I, I find myself going, okay, I agree with this idea. I don't agree with this idea. You know, I think the platform of the forward party, you've got some amazing ideas like uh, ranked choice voting, I think would be wonderful to reintroduce some sanity into politics, a more efficient government through technology, maybe some term limits, maybe closing that revolving door between politicians and, and lobbying. But the cornerstone of the platform or of the Ford party is, is universal basic income. And I, and I've got some questions for you on that, but before we dive into that, you know, it seems like character and relatability is more important than ever in politics. Uh, what's more important, like character or platform? How would you decide between somebody you really trust who believes in the same things that you do versus somebody you're not quite so sure of that who who has ideas that resonate better with you? Well, well, th this is the tough thing. First, thank you for the kind words. Um, I'm, I'm glad I remind you of people you worked with. And I, I'm, I'm sure it's pretty accurate um, because I'm something of an accidental political figure. I don't have the same motivations that most other people in the field seem to have. <laughs> you could be making more money in, in the technology business, presumably, than you're making today as a, uh, as a politician or at least a, uh, a, a social reformer. Yeah, but, you know, I found myself in a position where I might be able to make a difference. Um, and so it's like, well, you should lean into that and try and max it out. 
Um, but he, here's the, the thing that I concluded. And the book t- tends in this direction, but doesn't actually just come out and say it. Uh, that at this point, the policies that I'm for are more or less tribal markers saying, hey, um, these are the types of people that should be uh, into what I'm into. Um, But we have a political system that's so dysfunctional that that's what they are, is abstractions. Like like you shouldn't have any illusions that any of it's actually going to happen in real life uh, because (laughs) <laughs> the, like our, our system won't actually do anything um, except turn us against each other and make us crazy and, and uh, distraught. So it's doing that for sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's what, where, where the book was trying to um, land was like, look, like the, we should not expect anything to change or improve um, because it's not designed to change or improve. It's actually designed to get worse. Uh, and so when, when you ask about um, personal values versus structural reform, the, the, the problem is that at this point, our politics has become a character drama that's meant to distract us um, and tend to our emotions while the reality around us gets worse because no one can actually improve the reality. Uh, and, and so uh, I was with someone who is relatively, uh, you know, well-resourced and said to me, he's like, look, I just want good people in office and you're a good person. So I'm going to support you, which I appreciated. I mean, who doesn't want to be considered a good person? Um, but there's a, a lot of me that now believes that the nature of the people in the seats is less important or relevant than uh, the nature of the incentives in the machine. Uh, right. like, let, like, let's say I was, let's say, I, let's say things had gone phenomenally well. And I was even president and I had done everything I could um, that was consistent with my values and I helped some people and like da da da. And then I, I did four years or eight years and then I left. Um, I actually, and th- this is, uh, this is going to sound crazy to people. It was like, I actually don't think that, uh, that is going to fix anything. I mean, it'll make things better than if you have an asshole in that seat. Right. Um, <laughs> but, but structurally things will still be clunking along, uh, inflaming, turning us against each other, having people be rewarded based upon uh, these emotional appeals and tribal cues um, while, let's say, your kid's school gets worse or uh, your community gets less safe or your clean air and clean water gets dirtier and dirtier or wh- whatever it is. You know what I mean? And and then if, if you look at it and say, well, like, which of these things should I be caring about? Um, it, ideally, you'd care about the reality. Um, where it's like, if this person in office, you know, maybe they're a jerk, um, <laughs> but, but they'd actually enact the policies that you'd agree with most of the time. I mean, like that's the trap we're falling into right now is uh, trying to figure out uh, who we like or dislike um, when really at this point, if someone were to go in and say, look, I'll be president for a day, the way Lawrence Lessig was saying, it's like, but I'll get money out of politics. Um, that actually, in some ways, is more what we need than to have like another high character person in, um, though I prefer high character people to to low character people. Well, the book is is a, is sort of a diary of, of the time you spent running for president and then observations that came out of that experience uh, with incredibly interesting insights. What are a few things that you would want the average American to know about the role of money in politics that that hadn't really occurred to you before you started running? Uh, I think people should understand that money is so thoroughly entrenched in both parties uh, that the deck is going to be very, very stacked against anyone who is trying to change things appreciably. Uh, And uh, I talk in the book about how Democrats trust the media to a much higher degree than independents or Republicans. Uh, Among Democrats, 69% have a high trust in media, uh, whereas among Republicans, it's 15%. Independents, it's 39%. So the moneyed interests are going to end up trying to put a finger on the scales for whatever Democrat is more corporate aligned and status quo E. And on, on some level, Maybe that's cool because, you know, you prefer that to the flamethrowing socialist type. Um, But uh, maybe it's not so cool given that 
uh, maybe some things have gone out of whack and you might need someone who stands up to corporate interests in a particular way. Um, that, that this, and this is baked into right now, this ridiculous two party system we have so that you have literally billions of dollars getting poured into both the democratic and Republican party, just cinching them up so that nothing changes that adversely impacts various corporate interests. And then you have media kind of communicating the party line because they also get the corporate money, um, either through advertisements or otherwise. And, uh, and then the American people are just casting about for any kind of answer or uh, solution, and they can't have it because you've got this broken two-party system. So the Republican Party, which is anti-institutionalist, decides to get behind Trump in 2016. Uh, and then... You know, there are problems with it. I mean, I'm no Trump fan. Um, on the, the left, people embraced Bernie, um, but the corporate Dems kneecapped him over and over again in 2016 and 2020. Um, and it's an open question whether uh, that will continue forever um, or as long as the Democrats can, you know, maintain control of things. So uh, I'm just going to make a brief segue into the fact that Bernie is – Unfortunately, I think the last of his kind uh, or, you know, the like a singular figure where after Bernie leaves the stage, who inherits the Bernie mantle? Uh, you could say AOC, but she's got like a different energy and a different presentation and a different uh, focus than Bernie does. Um, you know, so it, it's like I, I think that that was the anti-institutional left's best shot, um, you know, for the foreseeable. Um, so that there's a lot of money that's trying to keep things relatively fixed uh, and stable. And then Americans are saying like, no, 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 I actually want some kind of change or some kind of, kind of difference. You can see that with Barack Obama uh, winning. You can see that with Trump winning. Uh, you can see that even with you know, to some extent, Joe winning in uh, 2020, because we just wanted to change from Trump at that point. <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, it's like a Bill Maher um, line where he says the only thought that Americans can remember consistently is throw the bums out. Right. Um, and so you have corporate money trying to see to it that whatever bums you throw out, things stay more or less the same for them. Yeah, you you made the uh, what I assume, what I felt was sort of counterintuitive coming from you uh, proposition that we should pay politicians more. Why why should we do that? Oh, well, one of the great mysteries in American life is why over half of members of Congress are millionaires uh, when a lot of them were not millionaires when they showed up. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And um, and you look at their salary, and it's one hundred seventy four thousand dollars a year, which is a lot by normal American standards, but it's not a whole lot if you maintain two homes uh, and you have to shuttle back and forth and, you know, it's not a whole. So I'd have to work for 15 years post-tax to save a million dollars, something like that. Something like that. Um, uh, and, and so um, that right now, they very quickly become the center of this vortex of money and are allowed to play in it in various ways. Like, I don't think members of Congress should be able to trade stocks. I think that's crazy. Um, but, you know, they, they go in and they just end up feeding at the trough in various ways. And worse yet, uh, when they leave, about half of them become lobbyists. Because if you are a member of Congress and you have all these relationships, what are you going to do? Go back to Wyoming and like chill out, and, like hang out a shingle? <laughs> you know, right. or are you going to hang out on Capitol Hill and like call your old buddies and get paid, you know, $600,000 for like pulling in a a favor every once in a while. I mean, someone tried to do a study on the return on lobbying um, and the, the number is something like 1700%, which means that they should be spending more on lobbying because, you know, you'd, you'd want to max it out to a point where you get down to, you know, only 50% or whatever, <laughs> right. whatever the, the, like the number is. So yeah, you have, and, and again, this is one reason why people are fed up and frustrated is that you have this revolving door you have these theoretical public servants, but then they show up in D.C. And oh, by the way, if you haven't been to D.C., have you been to D.C. in a while, Paul? Uh, it's been about four years. So so D.C. has its own vibe as well, um, but it's a pretty prosperous uh, town where it, it's actually... I, I, 
Yeah, George, Georgetown doesn't suck. Georgetown's a pretty nice joint. Yeah, it, it's nice. I, like, I think right now it's the third richest uh, metro area in the country after, I think, still like a couple Bay Area um, towns. Uh, and so when you get there, a lot of people are just like, I, I want to stay here. You know, like I, I want to freaking do everything I can to be a player here. Um I mean, the, the answer really would be to just move our nation's capital to Detroit or Cleveland or someplace where people <laughs> are like fucking happy to right. turn around. Uh, you know, I mean, like th that's exactly the kind of dramatic culture shift that we would need. Uh, I mean, I talked when I was running for president about moving D.C. agencies to Cleveland uh, or Detroit in the Midwest because uh, I was like, look, right now. Uh, costs are high in DC. The traffic is miserable. There are too many people. Um, let's just move an agency where it does not matter where you are to the Midwest. Yeah. And then everyone, you know, the cost would be lower. And like, I, I bet the agency would do a better job too, because instead of being in this bizarro bubble, like you'd actually be around normal people. And then you might, you know, like uh, have a different perspective. And have some people who are grateful for the work too. Yeah. I mean, you get, you send 10,000 jobs to Ohio and they'd be pumped. Yeah. Whereas 10,000 jobs in DC, everyone's pissed off that, you know, like they have to go to work and like navigate the traffic and all this nonsense. So, uh, so then some people responded to me they're like, Oh, you can never get people to move to the Midwest from DC. And then part of me was like, well, good. Yeah. 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 Really. It's like, it's well, the point, man. Or like, yeah, maybe, maybe you lose a few barnacles, you know, it's like, I'm like, <laughs> The barnacles. Like these are a few of the things that we really should be doing. Though I don't have any illusions, Paul. And this is the tough thing. And I don't know if this came through in the book. So I'm like a very optimistic, can-do, entrepreneurial sort. Um, but like the the scale of the dysfunction and the changes you would want to make is so vast that you would get in there. And 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 this is the great fear: is that uh, you get in there and you're like a fly stuck in amber. Um, and the machine just keeps on trucking, you know, like a reporter said to me years ago, she said, why does it feel like we're on a ride that leads us off a cliff and like, no one can do anything about it, even though we all see it's coming. Uh, and, and that's like the problem in American life in a nutshell, um, that you have like this system that's just going to clash and clash and do less and less. And, you know, like, uh, and um, Americans just get more and more pissed off and no one can do anything about it. Um, now, I, I think that there are some things we could do about it, and I, you know, try and point us in that direction in the book. But it's not like, hey, elect Andrew Yang president. It's, hey, let's change the incentives. Like, right. let's make it so you have nonpartisan open primaries and ranked choice voting, so that sensible people can get in and do sensible things without losing their jobs immediately. Because right now, you you have this character drama again, where ninety percent of the congressional districts are predetermined yeah you know it's like you you know you, you have this like a few dozen competitive races around the country and we pretend it's like these two sides going at it when really they've carved up the country like a turkey into <laughs> you know r red and blue parts and being like oh you know it's like like let's have no competition in 90 percent of the country Okay, so I want to spend, let, let's spend three and a half minutes on that because I think it's really important, but we've got to talk about UBI before we're done. So let's talk about uh, the primary issue and how we can address that and what effect, you know, please God, it might have in, in getting us some more moderate and nuanced positions from our uh, potential elected officials. Yeah, so the, the point I make to people is like, hey, what do you think the national approval rate of Congress is right now? Uh, and you've read my books, you probably know, Paul, but I'm anchoring listeners low. Uh, and it is low. It's around 20% uh, or so, four to five Americans not happy. And then you ask, what is the re-election rate for individual members of Congress? <laughs> it's high. It's very, very high. And that number, think of a high number, everybody. It's probably higher than you're thinking. It's 94% which is a higher win rate than the Jordan era Chicago Bulls or the Kevin Durant era Golden State Warriors, if you're a sports fan. Uh, and so you have to ask, it's like, wait a minute, how the hell can you have a 94% reelect rate if uh, only 20% of us are happy? And the answer is that 90% of the districts in this country are uncompetitive in the general because they're drawn that way. So you know it's going to be a Democrat or Republican. Paul, where are you interviewing me from? Uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Well, Atlanta, I mean, Atlanta is a very blue city, obviously, but 
blue city in a, in, a, in a sea of red. And, you know, our gubernatorial race is a perfect example of what you're talking about, right? You've got this primary, which in, in up until the Stacey Abrams, Brian Kemp election a few years ago was the predetermined of who, whoever the Republican nominee is going to be is going to be the governor. Yeah, yeah. And that's the way it is in most of the country. It's like whoever wins uh, the Democratic Republican primary wins. Um, and so if you are a Republican member of Congress, and by the way, there's a massive fucking problem right now in our country. If you're a Republican member of Congress, how do you keep your job? Uh, just avoid getting primaried because you don't mm -hmm. have any real competition in the general. So then how do you avoid getting primaried? You have to... By either out conservativing or out progressivizing the uh, the competition in the primary. Yeah, you just have to try and keep the extreme of your party from hating you. And so if you're a Republican, that means trying to be really Trumpy and uh, also extremist and flamethrower, even if that's not what you think. Because if you do anything else, your job security goes down. You vote for infrastructure, your job security goes down. You know, you vote to impeach, you, you lose your job. I mean, if you look at the numbers, the majority of the people who voted for either infrastructure or impeachment are already out. And then by the yeah. end of the cycle, maybe all of them are out. So if you look at it and you say, OK, do the right thing, it's like, well, if I do the right thing, I lose my job. So if you are a rational actor, you just keep your head down and be like, well, you know, better, better me than the next person, better us than the Democrats, whatever it is. On the Democratic side, it's a little different. And I get heat for this all the time, Paul, where they're like, the parties aren't the same. And it's like, no, they're not the same. Um, they're broken in different ways. Uh, whereas the, the Democratic Party, um, certainly you're right that there is the, you want to try and keep the progressives from hating you and getting pissed off at you. Um, but the Democratic Party really is run by a different set of interests. It's run by public sector unions. It's run by uh, big pharma. It's run by like di different interests that are in there um, playing in the primaries as well. Uh, and then there's like the, it, the overweighting of the um, you know, less mainstream folks. Um, but the, the, the corruption is different, but the corruption is present in both cases. Um, and the, the incentive to compromise uh, right now is very, very low, where if you compromise, your job security goes down because people will paint you as insufficiently ideological or, or out of step or whatnot. There was a time not that long ago where there was something called a pro-life Democrat. Uh, you right, know, like, like, right. like, like Joe Biden kind of resembled it a little yeah. bit because yeah. he's Catholic. Um, and, and now, you know, you cannot be a pro-life Democrat. I, I was trying to write a bit, you know, I'm a comedian when I'm not doing a world famous, amazing podcasting. And, um, I was trying to write a bit about how, how politics has changed and say, like, if I had to pick a party, I'd say I'm a Democrat, but I'm like a Mondale Ferraro Democrat, you know, I'm all about, you know, the, the, if, if you go back and you read that platform, they actually called out Reagan for being irresponsible from a budget perspective and underfunding local police. And it's like, oh my God, where have we gone as a country since then? Yeah, there, there, I mean, there've been different flavors of uh, the, the Democratic Party. Um, uh, the problem right now is that the Democratic Party is too big a tent. And people think, oh, having a big tent, I mean, I, I like Ford Party is a big tent. But Ford Party is a big tent yeah. in, in the sense that we actually expect you to disagree on various things, as long as we can agree on the fact that we should have better incentives and nonpartisan open primaries and right choice voting. Uh, and then we can agree to disagree on, on various things. Can you can you can, can you just break down real quick the, the benefits of open primaries and ranked choice voting? Oh, yeah, sure. So let me finish the story. You're right. OK, so so check it out. If I'm a member of Congress right now, my reelection hinges on whether I can just get the 10 percent of the most extreme hyper partisans in my district to vote for me. It's not deliver for 51 percent of the people right. in my community. It's just again, I'm just focused on these 10 percent of and some of them, some of them are crazy. Um, now, if you were to change the primary system to nonpartisan open primaries coupled with ranked choice voting, then anyone can vote for anyone in uh, your congressional race. And so it's not enough for me to placate and please the most extreme 10%. Now I have to do something of value for 51% of you. Uh, and that all of a sudden makes my incentives much more moderate. Uh, and in real life, the example I give is Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, who's maybe one of the most moderate Republicans. She's the only Republican senator who voted to impeach Donald Trump, who is up for re-election this year. And you look at that and say, whoa, that's bold. And 
it tagged her numbers among Republicans in Alaska, where her approval rating is now 6% among Alaskan Republicans, thus illustrating the fact that no one goes against Trump or else they're committing professional suicide. So why did Lisa Murkowski do it? Alaska changed to nonpartisan open primaries and ranked choice voting in 2020 such that now she can go to the general public and say, hey, look, yeah, I voted to impeach Trump. I'm my own person. Uh, I'm principled. I've done my best for you. And then independents can vote her back in, uh, moderate Dems, libertarians. It's not just left up to the Republicans. Uh, And so if, if you were to do this, you would have a much better, broader set of incentives for people who are in the two-party system. And it might even lead to a third party coming up uh, every so often in various communities. Uh, There's really no counter argument to this, except for the fact that the parties dislike competition and like control. And the people who have this 10% locked up love having control too, you know, And, and, and that's on both sides. All right, let's talk about UVI because it's a, it's it's a big cornerstone of your of your um, platform and one that raises a lot of very interesting questions. So, can you, for the one millionth time in the past five years, uh, explain what UVI is? So we can start with just some basic facts. Uh, sure. So, you, you yeah, UBI is a policy where everyone in a society gets a certain amount of money to meet their basic needs. Um, so, when I ran for president, I was running on a thousand bucks a month for everybody. Um, but I I do want to say, Paul. Um, UBI is something mm-hmm. that I personally am for, um, and think that we should alleviate poverty at, at scale. And, and it's one of our only big tools. Um, but the forward party right now, um, back to my earlier comment about the fact that what we're for or against is less relevant than fixing the structural mechanics, um, that the forward party is focused on fixing the machine. And then after we fix the machine, then we can have intelligent discussions right. about what the heck to do with the machine. Um, so if Andrew Yang were in charge of the machine, yeah, I'm for cash relief and enhanced child tax credits and a lot of other things. Um, but even people who disagree with me on that are now joining the forward party and saying, look, Yang's right that this machine is totally broken and dysfunctional. Yeah, well, that's kind of how I felt about the thing. I was like, I want more ideas like this. I want, I disagree with this one, but I want more people like Andrew in politics. I want more disruptive ideas f- from sources that are not the entrenched uh, leaders who have every incentive to keep things the way they are, as opposed to, um, as opposed to to looking for structural change. And even as you were brought up earlier, yeah, it'd be great to have a couple of more really good candidates in it. But like, if the whole system is designed to only attract the extremists, we're still going to be broken, even if we get six more of the greatest senators of all time into the Senate, for example. Yeah, that's exactly right, man. That, that's the way we have to start thinking about it. We have to start thinking, okay, um, how can I have a system that actually rewards people for being reasonable and productive and even take someone who's on the fence and makes them more reasonable and productive right. as opposed to the opposite, where you take right now, and I've met a lot of legislators It's easy to demonize them. I actually just feel bad for them. I just think they have a shitty life. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And so uh, you, but you get there and then your life just revolves around, okay, how do I keep like the party base happy? Like, how do I raise enough money? So the big wide moats and no one can challenge me. Like, how do I, like you you just become a creature of incentives. And so it's like, Hey, how about we improve your incentives? How about we make it so that you can do whatever you think is the right thing. And the general public can reward you or not. And oh, by the way, we'll have term limits and then maybe pay you a giant freaking sum on the way out so that you don't cling to power. And we don't have a gerontocracy where we have like 80 and 70 year olds running the show, even though they don't know shit about technology and don't understand what like the the average Americans dealing with because they've spent 30 years, you know, like at cocktail parties in D.C., um, you know, getting told how important they are. Um, There's something... Um, yeah, like the, the <laughs> I, I, fi- I do find, I find it pretty hilarious when Zuckerberg goes in front of Congress and there's some, some 80 year old froghorn leghorn guy who's like, now, Mr. Zuckerberg, can you, t- are you telling me that I can get vi- the television comes on my phone? How are you some kind of a warlock who delivers the TV? Can I get three's company on my yeah, phone? Bit, bit, like, you know, like, it's like, these guys know nothing about technology. Yeah, it's like, Mr. Zuckerberg, can you explain how your company makes money? It's like, well, they just make a gajillion <laughs> like on, on, yeah. uh, on selling our data to various but, 
companies I, I, like that. It, it's it, it's. I mean, I, I get upset about this because technology has transformed our way of life, and our government's been asleep at the switch. And they've been asleep at the switch because there's no political incentive for them to do the right thing by us and our kids. Are, are you a parent, Paul? I've got two kids, 11 and 12. Uh, boys, girls? Boy and a girl. Um, yeah, so I'm a parent too. Mine are a bit younger than you. Um, but social media is making our kids anxious and depressed and like hurt, hurting their mental health. I mean, the folks in Silicon Valley don't let their kids use this stuff. I mean, you know, it's right. like... like yeah. what, yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and then our government's like, meh, you know, why? Because, uh, you know, it's like, it, it, like there's not an interest group behind it, um, where they're, they're getting browbeaten over the fact that, you know, technology taking over our democracy, essentially, by the way, like Facebook's negatively correlated with democracy where wherever it goes, democracy slides back into autocracy, uh, including the United States of America. Um, uh, and and so like you because of our gerontocracy, they they just have these like irrelevant ideological objections to these tech companies that are now um, ruined lives and you know like made uh, agreeing on the truth next to impossible and a bunch of other things like it makes me really angry. Um, we've been failed at such an epic level that uh, you know like our kids are going to pay the price and like we're going to see, un- in my opinion, like really disastrous things unfold in the United States moving forward. Uh, and then like our government is just a bunch of like, uh, you know, uh, like olds, like having irrelevant arguments. Um, and the media is totally complicit, like serving it up. Oh, as you can tell, I'm very passionate. No, about I love it, man. It's great. Well, let's talk about you. Okay. Let's, without diving into all the specific details about UBI, let, let's just, let's just take a step back and say the idea of our social safety net program and one point, whatever, Five trillion dollar entitlement program is to help the the help develop a, uh, a a population of empowered people who have both the, the is that what it's well, for? I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> throwing I'm wrong. throwing it out I'm throwing it out there I mean I'm, and you, you know you tell me what it should be if I'm getting it wrong right is we should be helping people go from to 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 move up the economic ladder to be economically self sufficient to ha- to raise healthy kids who believe that they have a future uh, of th- that they can influence based on their on their effort and and abilities are, are we spending our money in the one you can please disagree with me and two if what's your definition and how should we be in investing the money such that we we get a stronger society out of that investment Someone told me that they made the welfare state purposefully difficult and painful to interact with um, back in the day, like in the 60s and 70s, uh, because they they wanted people uh, to be miserable if they were forced to interact with them. Mm. <laughs> and, they and probably did a met, pretty good job of, of achieving that yeah, goal. They did a good job on that level, sure. And having met now hundreds, maybe thousands of Americans who uh, are are reliant upon um government benefits i I mean tens of thousands if you include those on social security um of the folks i spoke to but like what what struck me is like the disabled iowan who said that she's afraid to volunteer at her local church because she's afraid she'd lose her disability payments right um or the single mom in new hampshire who says she wants to work part-time but she did the math and she loses money if she yeah works part time because she's getting child support uh, for her two kids. And then you, you look at this um, and you're like, well, that's a deeply system. If like, I think we can agree that like the, the first woman should be volunteering at a church. Second woman should be working part time. Um, and so you have a, a system that's put in place that uh, is kind of like a boot on the throats of the people that get this money. Um, and it pushes them to not do things that are good for them, good for their community, good for society. The the single biggest number I'm freaked out about that I think everyone should be freaked out about is, I mean, there are a lot of numbers I think we should be freaked out about, but um, it's the labor force participation rate in the United States at 62.3%, which is anomalously low. In the EU, it's 74%. Um, and, and each percentage point is like two and a half million workers right out of the workforce. Right. So if you imagine 30 million more Americans working, um, that's the difference between us and the EU. Um, and it, it makes me rage whenever I see the headline unemployment rate getting reported um, because it's like, oh, check it out, like 3%, 4%. Isn't that great? Isn't that low? It's like, hey, like, did you forget to account for the 30 million Americans uh, 
including many, many high school educated men who are like at, at home and um, on disability and like, you know, just going down conspiracy theory rabbit holes in their basements. Right. Uh, right. Like, you know, you, you forget about them. Did they stop existing because they, they dropped out of um, the, the workforce and that, that 62.3% has been declining for decades. Uh, you know, the, the decline really kicked off around when we automated away 4 million manufacturing jobs in the Midwest and the South. Uh, and so you have a disability system and a welfare system that is not meant to get people back in their feet. Uh, it's like after you fall in, it's like, okay, here are your, uh, your scraps. Like, and if you try and do anything that improves it, like we're going to take the scraps away. Um, and so it ends up being fundamentally disempowering for those people. Um, like, you know, you know what the churn rate is on the disability system in America? How do you define that? And what is it? I don't know. Like someone gets on disability and then they're like, I feel better. I got a job. I don't need disability anymore. Very close to zero. Yeah. Yeah. It's close to zero. Um, and so you have to ask yourself, it's like, okay, wait a minute. Is this system, what's it designed to do? And right now right. it's designed to shove someone into the shadows and say like, Hey, here's enough where you can maybe get by, uh, stay in the shadows. Um, you have no value anymore. Um, and I've met those people and like that they live in constant fear of like having their scraps reduced, uh, doing something that the scraps get taken away. It's really dehumanizing. We have a very brutalizing welfare state right now. So if you were to try to explain why universal basic income is uh, a, a productive enhancement to the entitlement program to a fiscal conservative would be would actually get more people back to work. And and being more productive as individuals. Oh yeah, it's like if if you got the money and and you got to keep it, if you did more, then lo and behold, people would do more. I mean, I think a lot of folks like I'm I'm someone who's run companies. Um, it's one reason I'm so passionate about trying to improve our political incentives because it's like, hey guys, guess what? Like you reward people for being assholes, you'll probably get more assholes. You you know, you're, <laughs> I'm willing to take that incentive. By the way, uh, you know. Uh, and, and so it, it's the same with our current uh, welfare state is like, hey, if I reward you for trying to game the system and uh, not trying to better yourself, then I'll probably get more of that behavior. Uh, you know, it's like if, if I would reward you, like if you were to ask me, it's like, hey, is Andrew Yang for uh, wage subsidies? Sure. Am I for like matching people? Like I, I want people to be doing awesome stuff and anything we can do to get people to do awesome stuff I'm I'm into um, I have real concerns about our government's ability to administer a lot of things at scale because our government is bad at a lot of things. Um, and so if you were to ask me, it's like, hey, what, what's the best way to have these government resources be deployed in a way that actually does enhance human flourishing and improves incentives? I'd be like, probably the best thing our government could do would be to send a check. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, like, like that, like in real life, that's probably one of the, the things that our government could do where it's going to do it right and effectively. It's not going to give rise to another army of bureaucrats who are like checking up on you and saying like, oh, I like what you're doing. Um, uh, and so <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. But, but a big, so, so efficiency could, you know, and I think that conservatives like um, Milton Friedman actually argued that we could make it, the entitlement system more efficient by having just a, a simple check as opposed to five different sources from five different uh, acronym based. It's more than five, but continue. Yeah, I mean, like, by, <laughs> you know, there's, there's an enormous amount of bureaucratic waste administering all these entitlement programs, right? And so conservatives would love to streamline all that, especially if you could use technology to make it happen. But, you know, a big part of your argument for for UBI is the coming AI apocalypse. Um, you know, in 1930, John Maynard Keynes made the prediction that his grandkids would only work 15 hours a week. And obviously that that just didn't happen. You know, in fact, we're working way more than we were back then. So w w to what extent do you think AI is really going to change the nature of, of, of the problem you just announced of underemployment of, of, of the overall workforce? It's just going to speed up, uh, you know, and, and the type of transformation we're seeing um, is going to apply to white collar workers as much as uh, blue collar, where there are a ton of routine cognitive tasks being done by, uh, you know, people that in another era would have been um, accountants, uh, travel agents, ad sales people. Oh, now it's personal. Uh, That's what stock, I used to do. Stock <laughs> traders. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, so you look at Mad Men, you look at Madison yep. Avenue, and you have these dudes like like dreaming up creative. Right. Like now, that's just all done by an algorithm, and you have like a twenty something year old being like, "Hey, I'll just like give you a program where we'll A B test like thirty two different things, and then just pile the money into whatever is the most effective until it stops working, and then just go down the tree." And so, like, I'm not going to convince you that I have brilliant creative. I, well, I'm going to convince you that I have like a, you know like an effective um uh, algorithmic distribution model and then you look at them and be like okay you know done and so like you go to new york and like these ad agencies have gotten um blown to smithereens a lot of them honestly right. um so uh, you, you have um you have this ai apocalypse that's actually already transforming various industries uh and when i was running for president i would talk about the fact that number one 35 percent of americans have college degrees 65 percent don't so then among the 65% who don't, uh, what are the most common jobs? Actually, no. The economy-wide, what are the most common jobs? Number one, retail and administrative, which includes call center workers. There are 2.5 million call center workers making 12 bucks an hour. When do you think Google, Google's AI will be able to do the work of those call center workers? Soon. Probably right now. You know what I mean? I mean, heck, they, they are replacing them right now. Um, so there are a bunch of problems with that, where if you have two and a half million Americans who will still work at call centers, and then like, what is their next move? A lot of them pay taxes. How much does Google pay in tax? Number two is retail. I mean, like, look around, you know, what used to be your local mall or yeah. whatnot. I mean, retail workers are, not, you don't think it's AI, but it is AI because the, the retail industry is getting disrupted by Amazon and Amazon has AI arranging their uh fulfillment center logistics so that you know you don't have to have as many people uh number three is food center and food prep food service and food prep number four is trucking and transportation which includes uber and limo drivers and number five is manufacturing um so ai is going to affect all those industries um and then you look at the most common non uh the most common routine white collar jobs uh a lot of them are going to go away too so uh, it's happening right now and it drives me nuts that, um, that we like we we so here here's the the story. I actually I didn't put this in the book, but I really should have. Um, so I go around. I'm running for president. I sit down with dozens, maybe hundreds of journalists, and I say, "Hey, we automated away four million manufacturing jobs uh, over the last thirty years, and that's what led to Trump." And you know what? No journalist ever said to me, or political figure, they never said. Wow, four million! Like when we get to eight million, we should really do something mm. about that. Um, the number is irrelevant. I could have said eight million. I could have said fourteen million. I could have just made shit up. Like it, it doesn't matter because our system will not actually ever say like, oh, like at twelve million, we should really like start trying to uh, adjust, evolve, adapt because the two party system actually does not care about what happened to those twelve million people. Um, the 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 two party system is like, well, can I like just move my my uh, appeal someplace else like democrats used to be competitive in iowa ohio missouri they're now getting shredded in all those places but they're like hey doesn't matter i'll just move to georgia arizona uh and virginia and then what happened to those iowans and ohioans and missourians that that used to vote for me i don't give a shit um you know what's that like i blew up their factory yeah. towns who cares yeah. You know, so it, I mean, like that's that's the real darkness, right? Right. Uh, I want to be respectful of your time, so I'll let you go after a couple, uh, one or two more questions. What do you? You're a parent, and you, and obviously, you care a lot about the United States of America, but you care probably more on a daily basis about your children, right? So, what kind of guidance? What kind of preparation? That's why I named them U.S. and America. No, I'm kidding. I didn't do that. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, there's such a thin line between patriotism and nationalism, isn't there? Um, wh what do you, wh how are you going to prep them for the future, for this, for this future that is uncertain for, for this future that where, where change will be even more, uh, uh, prominent and, and rapid than it is today. What do you, how do you prepare? How do you look forward and say, this is the way you prepare yourself for, for, for being an adult? Dude, this is... This is so dark, man. Oh, God. Yeah. So I, I, I referenced a little bit about my own childhood. Um, so check it out. Like you grow up like the skinny, scrawny Asian kid in the mm -hmm. uh, Italian-American suburb or whatever. 
um, get into fights all the time, get a chip on your shoulder, go to the gym, uh, you know, like uh, drink the protein shakes and, and, and generally just feel like, okay, I've got to like fight for my boyhood, manhood, fight for my career, fight to make a difference. Like, uh, uh, and my kids are just soft little gerbils. They're just like, you know, like mewling and da, da, da. I mean, I love them obviously, but I, I look at them and I'm just like, wow, you're growing up so differently than I did. <laughs> And, uh, I mean, my parents were immigrants, you know what I mean? Like they didn't know shit about shit. Like I, I didn't even own pajamas. Like I, like, um, I, like I discovered to my chagrin in like fifth grade that I wasn't supposed to sleep in my clothes. Um, you know, like in, in the school, <laughs> I slept in my golf shirt last night. My wife hates it. So, uh, it's still an issue in our house. I mean, no, I mean, that's fine. as an adult. So, um, uh, but but you know i mean you're asking for the parents that are out there and, and here's like the the darkness is that a lot of parents look up and be like wow america's going to shit like what am i gonna do it's like and, and the rational thing to do is be like hey let me feather my own nest and make sure that like you know uh, i'll be able to take care of me and mine regardless of like you know what goes on um a lot of people are making that calculation right now a lot of people are also being like hey where would the hell would i go if shit really hits the fan um so uh, so that's what, you know, that's a position a lot of American parents are, are, are now being put in. Um, you want your kids to be adaptable and tough and resilient-ish. Uh, I mean, those words don't apply to my kids, honestly. But if, um, you know, like, but you, you, you do want to allow for some adversity um, because the, the, like one of the numbers I cited in a recent um, commencement speech I gave is that the average young person is going to have 12.3 jobs throughout their career coming up. So uh, there's not a course of study that's going to insulate you. Like you really do want to be someone who is positive and adaptable uh, and can work with different people in different settings. Um, that's the best way you can prepare your kids at this point. Right on. Hey, Andrew, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. And I want to say thank you to you for your work and your passion and your commitment to our country. Uh, whether people agree with you or not, I think most people, uh, you know, they, they hear what you have to say and go, well, that's somebody who cares about our world. So thanks for all you do. Thank you, Paul. And if anyone wants to see what a real fix could look like, please do go to forwardparty.com. 62% uh, uh, of Americans know we need a third party. Uh, you know, 50% of us self-identify as independents. A lot of this brokenness is because we have this really, really unrepresentative, polarizing, inflammatory political system uh, we got to fix the incentives or we're never going to get out of it. Uh, it's not about having one good person win one race. It's about trying to fix the machine so that you don't care as much about the people being perfect because the system will actually reward the right kind of behavior and policy. Forwardparty.com or andrewyang.com. I, I uh, put stuff up there on the regular because, uh, you know, got to keep people feeling positive. Like there's a, a real answer because there is a real answer, but it requires a lot of us to get together. Oh, also one last question. Um, I've gone to GoDaddy and I've reserved Andrew Yang 2024. What should I do with that URL? Oh shit. That shit was available. <laughs> My team's terrible. <laughs> oh, someone's getting fired. <laughs> All um, right, Andrew, man. Thanks for your time. We'll put links to those uh, websites in, in the show notes. I really appreciate you taking the time. Appreciate you. Have a great summer. Hey, everybody, if you like what we're up to here at Crazy Money, do us and yourself a favor by following the show on your favorite podcast app and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Also, click the link in the show notes to subscribe to my new Substack, where you'll get biweekly thoughts on the role of money in our world and in our lives directly to your email inbox. Thanks for sticking around. We'll see you next week.